in the first turn, we had a lot of political points to start the game. Now they, we don't. <laughs> Here it is in... What is this? Spring of 62, which I believe means we're going to be adding some cards, which I will... put on top of the decks to remind me to reshuffle them. Um, we also have some reinforcements coming in. But basically, what we're going to be able to buy using discretionary points, as it were, uh, which includes buying CSPs, which we largely really need if we're going to fight battle. We need to buy some of them. The Confederates are probably going to sink all four of their PCs into CSP so they can actually win some battles. Um, but in terms of buying naval units and all this other stuff, it's going to be tough to do. <laughs> the promotions, all this stuff that's uh, voluntary. Now some of it is not based on the PCs. So, For example, this would be free promotions. We're not going to see any of them it looks like. Uh, so that's not really an issue. But in terms of the choices of do you want naval units or do you want to win the land war, you're faced with some uh, pretty hard choices if you didn't ba bank PCs. And the Union managed to bank a lot of PCs. Not enough, they've got enough to get the initiative, which is more than the Confederates, but not enough to force the Confederates to take the first move. Once you get to that kind of lead, you've got a real advantage because that means you're going to have the last card play. So you can conceivably knock them down to a defeat. Uh, as it stands now, the fact that the Union has to go first is kind of a balancing factor in play. But once you get enough of a PC lead, that goes away. All right. Well, uh, I'm not sure when reinforcements come down. They come down during the administrative phase. So I'm going to start doing that for the Union. Uh, the Union has a lot of points. They probably want to at least cover the amount of CSPs that the Confederates are going to build. Maybe some more than that. So that they can also win battles. But they have other things they want to buy. They want to uh, proceed with the blockade. They want to chase down these raiders who are going to cause them problems, perhaps. Uh, they may have some promotions in mind. A lot to do with very few points. It's only... We got 14. Oh, actually, we have a 10 PC lead. No, nope, the Confederates are going first. This is a bad sign. <laughs> this is a real bad sign. The Union's done well enough in the war so far that the Confederates are going to have to uh, go first, which means they have to kind of hoard their points uh, this turn so that they don't get slammed at the end of the turn uh, for, for a loss. All right, well, I'll go ahead with the Confederates then. They don't have a lot of choices here. I'm in an annoying situation which isn't well covered by the rules as far as I can tell again. Uh, the advance I did into here and now some reinforcements have pushed Johnston's force up to a major army in size. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The reinforcements were just two, so I was already over that limit. But here's the thing. A major army requires that there be a three-star general, but there's no real discussion of what happens if you exceed that. And, uh, stacking limitations are 12. I, I think what, what I'm going to do is he can't move without that, but he's allowed to have that stack there or something. I don't know. Again, lots and lots of places in these rules where I don't feel like uh, they nail things down at all well, where you kind of have to figure out what you're trying to do. <laughs> um, maybe it's just my eyes and my brain not absorbing everything, but I don't think so. I'm you know, looking as best as I can and I can't find these things. All right, yeah, including looking through my memory uh, of the game. So 
that's one problem there that I'm running into. I'm going to allow that stack to be there, I guess. Uh, I just don't know what to talk about with that. <laughs> um, all right. I missed last turn. AP Hill defeated uh, McDowell. There's an auto promotion rule if you defeat the GIC or if you defeat a force with double the strength. That automatically gives the CO a promotion. So AP Hill's been promoted to two stars as well. And I'll just put him in there. That I don't think has affected anything. He's not going to take command over Johnston. Uh, because he entered the hex. I would actually rather have him in command because Hill's got a better initiative rating there. However, I can uh, activate Johnston and move, I'm guessing, no more than six stars out of the hex, which <laughs> probably has to be Johnston. Uh, what I'm thinking is he can't command more than six stars, so he can't say, hey, you six go there, uh, which is what I would really like to do. But I also don't feel like I can activate anyone but him in that stack. That's just an anomaly that I'm going to have to cope with where the rules don't seem to cover things. Uh, right now what I'm working on I've spent most of the union points and then forgotten what I've done because I started trying to find a rule. I'm not sure whether or not, basically I'm looking at upgrading Hancock. If I put bring him to two stars and then move him over here, can he take command of McClellan's little force? Uh, or is that going to cost me an additional PC? Something tells me that the, it's an additional PC, but I'm not able to find that rule so far. I've spent about 10 minutes looking for it. Uh, <laughs> this is, again, this is how you will play this game. Until you come up with what the rules are that you're going to play with, or until they get rewritten, or until, um, you know, uh, maybe play aids... Uh, Triumph of Chaos had this situation where there, a lot of the players who really loved the game made up plays, which at least there, there seemed to be a definitive rule set uh, if you worked hard enough and making the plays helped. Here, there, you're already beginning to see people who love the game enough, who see enough in it that they are making plays. Me, I'm so far not convinced yet uh, that there's anything all that special here. Uh, Triumph of Chaos, I do see something special enough in. This one, well, maybe as I play more, I will grasp more of it. Uh, more of the spirit of the game that's catching some people. Because there are definitely people who like this. And it's just, man, wading through these rules and fighting for them. <sighs> I don't know how worth it it is, but hopefully by the next time I play it, some of these people who love it will have made those plays, and uh, I'll, I'll print them out, I hope. <laughs> I'm going to go with a rule that I found that seems to indicate I don't have to pay. Uh, I know in my memory there's something that says I do somewhere in here, but I can't find it, and this is the first thing I found. Um, if you want to replace a CO, you can promote a subordinate to a higher rank. Uh, you can appoint an infantry subordinate whose rank is equal to the CO to take place during purchase. That costs one PC. And you can move the GIC or any other senior general into the forces hex. Well, that sounds pretty clear. Uh, if I found a contradiction to that, or an implied contradiction, um, you know, I can't really be blamed for following the clear statement there. So I think I can upgrade Hancock to two stars and I'm going to do that. Other things I did, I built my navies. By the way, the Confederates actually built, I don't know, I don't know if I said this, they built a raider. So they only have uh, three CSPs. The Union bought themselves six CSPs to make sure that they have the military advantage on any bidding. Now, it's possible the Confederates could run out the Union CSPs, let them win some victories, but, or, you know, whatever. <laughs> um, 
but they're playing with a smaller handful of points at this point. Okay, so I got two more points left. I do want to spend those, I think. The only reason to bank PCs at this point uh, is the hopes of getting the Emancipation Proclamation early. Uh, I actually had enough points, I think, last turn to have done it if I had gotten a victory. Um, it was going to be 10 points. This turn it's only a 9 point difference. But in order to do it, I also have to defeat a 2 or 3 star commanding officer. Uh, commanding a force of 6 stars or more. And uh, I don't think I was in that position, but I'm not sure. I may have been when I took Springfield. Um, it's not required, I guess, that I do it, so it's to my advantage to do it, uh, which means, you know, I'm just going to leave it go, uh, like other things that I may have screwed up, or that I definitely did screw up. Uh, this one I'm not sure I did, but yeah, I want to I wanna keep uh, an eye on that. Now, so my plan then is to rail Hancock in charge of here so that I can launch another attack into Virginia. Ignore Kentucky as long as I can. Uh, the Confederates have some force over here in the West, and I don't particularly want uh, to have to deal with that. Another issue, it's not entirely clear in the rules whether or not you're supposed to do the administrative phase in order. In particular, you get your reinforcing generals on the map during the reinforcing phase, and, well, can you promote one of the generals who just showed up immediately to two stars? My feeling is that kind of is bending is taking a wrong tack. In particular, if you can do that, um, why not promote to two star and promote to three star all at once or something like that. So I'm kind of saying you have to follow the order in terms of where it's important. Uh, so reinforcements don't come on the board, I think until last. So you're not going to be able to draft, promote them, or anything else. Um, what is the net effect of that? Well, you can do them kind of simultaneously for your planning situation, but it has to be an ordering that could conceivably have followed uh, the administrative phase ordering, which is to say you can't promote someone. Well, actually, no, this does look like you could do it. Overstacking. Let me see if that uh, disallows, now that I have a rules reference, because rules references don't always exist here. Now this is the number that I, this is the number that I have. So there's no stacking limitation uh, based on the commanding officer. There is this vague idea of a major army which must be commanded by a three-star general, uh, but that's not covered under stacking, which is why I have this situation here. Just to totally scatter my brain here. Um, so I've got two more PCs I've got to spend. I've built my naval forces. I don't know what else to spend them on. I want to do it on a promotion, but I can't do grant. I could promote banks, but I don't particularly want to promote banks, do I? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm having kind of a hard time finding someone I want to promote. If I promote McClellan, then I can't just move Hancock in and take command. Can I promote someone over here? I've got two, three, four, five. Okay, let's look at all these leaders, because I can promote one of them, and see who looks the best. 
Siegel looks like he gets a an attack bonus here. Well, I don't know. So I've got a 1-1 one, one here. That turns into a 2-2, two, two, so I'm getting one on each. 2-3, one on each. 3-2, one on each. So it's all about the same. Uh, I'm either going to go with Siegel or Halleck. Now, Halleck outranks just about everybody on the board here, uh, technically, but yeah, we'll upgrade Siegel. Uh, and really shouldn't be being used as a, f a field commander in any state. One thing that I thought this game was going to cover, I remembered, maybe mistakenly, from the video that there were uh, theater commands that were handed out. And that's perfect to explain what Halleck does. Halleck was, although sometimes a bit petty, a decent administrator of his theater. And that's the exact job that he was supposed to go into. And I seem to remember when John went over in one of the earlier videos that he was talking about this particular case that, hey, you know, even generals like Halleck have a useful role in this game. And I was thinking how much greater that was than the old Victory Game Civil War game where you just have a whole collection, you know, Halleck, Fremen, all these jackasses with high rank, three-star generals that you absolutely want not to ever command anything, most specifically an army. Well... <laughs> Here now I'm dragging Halleck along under Lyons. Lyons, who I think at the beginning of the war is breveted to a brigadier general, um, if uh, I'm not mistaken, but, you know, is incredibly effective. And Halleck, who I think is second in charge of the army at this point below Winfield Scott. Uh, <laughs> what's going on here? Anyway, now Halleck vaguely took the field in supporting roles at times, but he was always the Western theater commander. It does not make sense for him to be leading in a, 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 a core of lion uh, or a division of lions's force. All right, uh, so that was my second upgrade, and now we made it to the rail phase. Uh, sorry, the naval phase. And here, the Confederates have to move first. I push my boat out. The Union gets to pursue. I'm throwing... Oh. Sorry. The Confederates get their uh, blockade, of their effects uh, first, as soon as they move out there. This unit did not move columns or switch columns or whatever it's termed as. So I guess it gets a roll. I'll have to find that roll. Getting more used to it. Um, that's how it's worded, right? It does not change columns, right? Okay. So before these ships get out there, we're rolling, and on a four through six, the Union's gonna lose a CSP. And we did nothing. And now the Union goes into play, and they're get to hunt raiders. I roll a die for each group shadowing or hunting. A fleet alone sinks it on a six. Uh, if I've got both, it's four through six. So here I've got a four through six, and I sink that raider, and here I've got just a six, and I do not. Now the sunk raider, this, these guys have to be reassigned to a blockade roll now, no, at the beginning of the naval segment. Uh, I'm trying to see what happens to sunk ones. I think it just goes back in the pile and I can rebuild it. I don't think it's removed from the game permanently. I hope. <laughs> um, I'm not doing anything on the blockade yet. I just don't have enough fleets to lock the blockade down as part of the problem. 
And... So see, this is weird. Perform naval operations in order. Now, each player is supposed to do their phase separately. That's what the initiative says, right? I hope there's not another damned exception in this one. In each phase in the turn, the player, the union player has, the initiative goes first in every phase. Okay, that sounds pretty significant here. And then here, it's uh, the player with initiative will determine who moves first. It sounds like the normal rule here. When we get to the resolution, there's nothing in here that indicates that... Uh, well, there's this annoying thing. During raiding operations, the Confederate player always goes first. What the hell? Am I doing the phase, or is raiding its own special thing? If raiding's its own special thing, these were opposed. Did that affect anything? Yeah. That affected the die roll here. I'm not going to worry about it. The Confederates didn't gain anything. But man, make your mind up and, 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 and you know, organize the game so that it makes sense, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, where are we? We're on the rail phase. The Confederates get to rail. I've got to think about this, and I'm taking a break from this one. Okay, for the rail movement phase, I indeed pulled Hancock over here, and he's now in charge. I pulled a couple of troops out of Washington right through this hex. Now, CAF has an effect on rail hexes, but only if they actually interdict with rail interdiction tokens, which have not been placed. They're allowed to place one per activation or something like that during the operations phase. So, <clears throat> they're not actually affecting this railway. And then they get removed after they have their effect, essentially. Although they do have supply effects, etc. Uh, but this is the only time you can do rail movement in the game. The Confederates pulled uh, both Forrest and... Van Dorn into place. Remember, calf don't count against stacking, which is important because I have two, three, four, five, six stacking points here. Um, that's not a huge deal. This is the army, but I'm planning on crossing into the Trans Mississippi with that. Again, with the shit, you know, Kentucky just doesn't matter. <laughs> now, this is getting kind of dangerous to make this Kentucky just doesn't matter policy. Because if all I'm leaving is Buckner and Pillow here at uh, Fort Henry and Donaldson, well, the Union, instead of swinging down and trying to fight their way through the mountains with Hancock, could just go for a Western campaign. That's uh, an issue. <laughs> There's no question there. Uh, however, uh, this is not a major army, so it has no real problem in terms of uh, actually, it can actually cross the river uh, reasonably well. This is the Mississippi, so it couldn't even be crossed by a major army, although I think the army could disperse and cross it or something. I don't know. It's weird to have my commander-in-chief going out that way, but I feel like the rules for Kentucky in this game are kind of forcing my hand. Of course, the rules for Kentucky may also force... Uh, the reaction to the rules may force the Union's hand to actually intervene in the West and start doing something. I kind of have to do something because I have to worry about the Mississippi. Uh, as of right now, though, yeah, there's not much I can really do here. Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm being foolish trying to consider this attack, but. <laughs> I'm just worried because I can actually sail down the other bank of the Mississippi. It's the one river you can do that kind of thing with, if I recall correctly. Again, a lot of the rules just keep fading out of my head because they just never really sunk in well. A whole bunch of things that are all special cases. That may be the case with a lot of games, though. I'm beginning to wonder about my capability of remembering. Not just now, but always. Oh, God. 
Uh, now we're at the operations phase. I've dealt out the cards. I wanted to look at them a little bit to see what I drew. I haven't done so yet. But uh, one thing that I'm noticing is even with just one shuffle, I'm starting to get some marking on these guys. You know, I hate sleeves and I feel like this game and uh, what the hell, the other MMP CDG that was recent, the Crusades one, which Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, I feel like both of them kind of have some of the best cards ever made, in a sense. You know, this really wonderful texture to really good shuffling capacity, but they do mark up more quickly than some of the others do, which my figuring is, well, everything will be marked and it'll all be minor marks along the edges, like you get with a poker deck eventually as you're playing it. These are a little bit easier to mark up, but that's not a, a terrible thing. So, uh, Confederates have the initiative this turn, so we're going to have to look at them. Uh, we have a blockade runner. That's going to give us some uh, political points more valuable than what we have otherwise. That's kind of a cool card if we were blockaded heavily. Uh, this would ride as uh, it, it would have less of a chance. A forest card, which is a battle card. A fairly valuable one. Earl Van Dorn, another battle card. Bonus his forces. Oh, another sedition card. I only have one, and I don't have ten PC, so I can't just discard that. Uh, opposition to Lincoln. I don't think that has anything to do with Daniel Hill, whoever he is. Uh, that's a valuable card to throw some penalty into play early in the game, and we're early. Pendleton, attack. Any resource or CSP played by the U.S. are ignored and lost. Oh, that's sweet. And I get an additional combat value. So I've got some nice cards here. And uh, another anti-U.S. PC if a battle's taken place. Associated with Polk for no apparent reason. You know, the pictures on the cards don't seem to have, and the people represented, don't seem to have much to do with what most of the cards have to do. For the Union, they have um, another card to flip with a surprise attack. The defending force becomes the attacker, and the attacking force becomes the defender. Uh... There's not a lot of advantage to attacking and defending. I'm not quite sure what the value of that is, except you might gain a hex, uh, conceivably, that you wouldn't otherwise gain. I don't know. I'm not sure I'd play that. Bonus in Virginia combat. Wow, lots and lots. Well, Dahlgren certainly fits with artillery. Um, lots and lots of... Uh, Combat cards here. Negate the use of a CS artillery card and add three to the U.S. attack strength. Now, if that ends up playing against the other one, this one trumps it. So that's kind of sweet. Uh, an increased cost of four PC brag or polk must be promoted as if he won a major or minor victory this campaign turn. If he won a major or minor victory. In the state occupied by the general to be promoted. Oh, you know, shit. I may not want to draw all these. I had a desire to get a campaign, actually. Fuck. See, I'm not sure I'm going to use a campaign here. I was thinking it would be kind of cool to do a double move here. What are my campaign choices? I just don't think I'm set up for moving two forces in most places. Like, I could move Lee and... Well, the Confederates won a campaign, damn it. I think the Union are going to pass on a campaign. Well, a Trans-Mississippi campaign could be of use, conceivably. Because I can start pushing down here. 
or at the very least move from it someplace. Yeah, I want a Trans-Mississippi campaign, so I'm going to randomize a U.S. card that I'm not going to take. And the Confederates want a campaign, too. Uh, they might want a Trans-Mississippi, too. But I think they're going to go with an Eastern campaign because I have this weird stack that I don't know what to do with. So I'm going to randomize a couple of cards that come out. I'll take care of that. Get that. <laughs> I had to reverse it. They, uh, these require 10 or more PCs on your track. No way I'm anywhere near that right now. Now, it's possible it could get there, but I don't want to take a card that's absolutely useless to me. It's not going to give me any PC or anything. Uh, if I get some reverses, like let's say the... Shit, I bumped something. Um, both sides are down to zero PCs. I've spent all my points. You gotta hold 10 in the bank if you want to use a campaign, so that's no fun. Okay, so we'll continue with this. Uh, at the increased cost of 4 PC. What the hell? At the increased cost. They must be promoted. I guess that means the Confederates have to pay to do this. Not well described. Uh, if the CS player holds certain cards, he has to discard one. Well, this is a pretty crappy card, so that's probably what I'm going to open up with to try to rip away some of these politician cards. Of course, that may end up being the seditious character. Uh, he's a senator here. I think I got the right one. It's the only one I found in the deck, so... <laughs> that's... I, I ripped randomly replace something and it was that. Uh, an entrenchments bonus? Uh, yeah, they couldn't hit an elephant at this dist. Um, increases a defense of a force. A seditious character. Not much I can do with that that I understand yet. I don't think I had a card that gets rid of a seditious character. Now here's the thing. You could hold this in your hand and bank it. Yeah, you hold it in your hand for next turn with the hope that you can get rid of a seditious character easily. The danger with that is that's almost like playing your last card before your enemy does. Which is to say, if he can drop your total points down to zero, you lose the game because you don't have something that can boost your PC after he acts. Uh, so... You know, I gotta decide what I'm gonna do here. If I can, I wanna get my PC up to 10, obviously, where I can start discarding seditious characters. Anyway, we'll start with the operations. Uh, force it on the Confederates, right? All right, onward. First few card plays, the blockade runners give some CS, uh, some PC to the Confederates. They also played the Daniel Hill to remove four US PC. Playing that early is weird. So you'd like to play that late in the turn, but they know the Union plays after them, so they're probably gonna bank um, some PCs at the end of the game at the end of the turn if they need to. So I'm not gonna win the game off that card. And given that, taking away a bunch of the CSP points was valuable. At the same time, what the Union did. And no, I don't know why I have a PC there and not a CSP. Uh, I played the uh, Morton card, which didn't do anything for me. And now I'm playing Wallace for his points. Not that it's really Wallace. But I'm playing the Ops points here, two points. Oh, that's the PC. I banked that PC, and I'm launching an attack here. I put down the cards for both. The problem is I still need to do a Virginia action or else I'm going to uh, lose PCs over with the Union. So I kind of don't want to commit much to this fight. Uh, even though I have some combat cards, I chose not to play any of them because one of them was Virginia only. 
One of them's a defensive that obviously doesn't apply. And the Dahlgren one is very good, but it's also a five point card. And I'm a little hesitant about using such a big card over in the Trans Mississippi. I'm already expending some more effort than I probably should there. So I committed nothing. The Confederates committed a CSP, but they played the Van Dorn card, which removes the, uh, prevents the placement of an IT, and it also prevents the loss of a CSP. Well, I'm losing a CSP for this. I'm actually not, so I get that one for free. So I'm going to have a slightly higher strength. Uh, for the strength here, well, the city provides nothing because of the garrison, so I've got three, four, plus a die roll. So I've got a total strength of four here, and the Union has one, two, three, four, five, nine, nine. No bonuses here. I added one here, so this is five. So it's going to be a four-point defeat. Hmm, that's not sounding good. A four-point defeat is a minor victory. The defender is going to take two ITs, but that card prevents one of them. I can get rid of that card because it'll confuse me otherwise. This I need to leave up. These I can get rid of. Uh, and the attacker is going to suffer one as well. Okay. Now I have to decide, am I retreating? It's a long road for, Van Do for uh, Johnston to make it here. It's going to take him a couple of turns to make it to attack. Um, so... It's not like giving up Missouri seems to mean anything in the game. I think these will turn, will convert, but that's not specified. Nothing specified as to what happens when you gain a state, is it? Uh, control of Missouri means controlling four more of the cities. Maybe that's a victory point thing? Yeah, it's a victory thing at the end of the game. So, that's not going to mean much. So, all I'm talking about here is really uh, the capture of the city itself. I'm going to take the retreat, which is going to cause, this is a two-star general, so that's two PCs, I believe. Uh, I think I lose and they gain or something. Yeah. Hmm, there's no PC loss listed for the defeated. Am I confused about that? Let me look that up. That's going to be another 5-10 minutes to look up and find the rule, the set of rules pertaining to something that I want to look for. Maybe not that long. It looks to me like these actually cover it. Uh, the attacker, or the winner, gains PCs, which in this case Stumber of stars. Yeah, the number of stars. So the winner gains one, two, three PCs, and the loser loses one for giving up the city. That's the cost. If I stood, I would take another hit and undergo a siege. You know, that doesn't sound bad. One, two, three, down, and one additional. I'd rather not give that up. So I'll take the hit. Let him march in. Now here's the question. Do I want to leave Springfield essentially undefended? I don't have to send everybody in. But the only force that can face me is this one, and I don't think I can do anything about it. 
if I'm there. So I'm going to advance in with everything. Now we have to make casualty checks. And nothing exciting happens. And I think that's it. Uh, this was the Union action to attack there. So we go to a Confederate. And because there was no retreat, because he took it as a siege, we're not going to get any PCs off that. It seems silly to me to give the enemy PCs. That's what the game's all about. Of course, it does mean... Oh, i got to replenish from this card. And I got another combat card. Um, it does mean, though, that I took a little bit more damage, and now the Union can activate this each turn to do one damage to me. They probably don't want to, though. They want to walk away and hit it again. Uh, that's much more effective <laughs> than sieging it. Um, all right. Okay, well, I struggled mightily over the last couple of cards played. The Confederates played a... Uh, this one, which took away two USPC. Uh, the US was considering a naval action against New Orleans, but they can't do it because they don't have 10 PC. That, they figured the whole thing out, was ready to do the battle, and then realized, whoa, wait a minute, I can't do that. Uh, um, so what I did instead was I spent the four-point hooker card, uh, banked three of the PCs, and launched an attack on Charleston even though the Confederates threw a defensive card, which they were going to use with New Orleans, and that got them an extra draw. And that's part of the point is get some PCs up. Uh, <laughs> this one-point card, they have too many combat cards in their hand, and uh, doing that seemed to help. This, I think, uh, obviated any need for the Virginia stuff. Okay, time to look for that. Every attack, including a cavalry raid on a Confederate force. Yeah, I didn't do that. Uh, so I'm not going to get any points for this. However, I think I succeeded in attacking it. Now here's the thing. I had an 8-point overrun. What it says is I can continue moving. I don't know what that means because I moved one hex and attacked. Now I'm in the mountains. Can I push another hex forward? I don't know. <laughs> you know, again, one of those things that the way the rules are written is in such a loose fashion that you can't really judge what's going on. Regardless of what happened there, though, a one-point PC changed for grabbing that city from the Confederacy. Uh, and... I can't for hell or high water decide what the value of the Confederacy attack in Kentucky might be. They totally do not want to do it, which makes putting this your, your GIC pretty questionable, right? <laughs> Except that I'm going to go into the Trans-Mississippi with it. Um, all I'll do is hand five PCs to the Union and grab cities which will then become potential liabilities to me. They're not going to help me in any sense. The only way, reason it would be of any value is very late in the game if it looks like uh, I can grab Kentucky. For the Union, there's somewhat more reason to do so, which is if this leaves and there's nothing down here to launch an attack. There's also the importance of getting through and making an attack along the Mississippi, but I could make that attack out of the Trans-Mississippi just as easily and circumvent any kind of invasion of Kentucky, just let it remain free, which is pretty much where I'm sitting right now until and unless this moves out of there. Uh, other than that, not much happened, just those two cards and I need another. Confederates are in a painful position here with a handful of cards. One a seditious card, horrible. The others are all very good combat cards. I drew the forest card. That's going to reduce a unit's strength by three if forest is involved in the combat. Well, he's in this stack. If I could get that up there to fight, that would be great. Pendleton um, gets rid of resource or CSP played by the U.S. and just eliminates any effect, yet you still pay them, which is very valuable, although less than it was because... The U.S. has some CSP, something the Confederates actually seem to have more of. I don't know how that happened. 
they gained them somehow. Um, maybe they've had them all along. I've, it's hard to remember when I walk away. Uh, which I always do. So, And then uh, the long street card here adds two to your strength and disregards two IT. Well, I think given the lack of CSP, this is my best card right now. So I'm going to make my attack with Johnston. That's going to give me three quick PC. And I'm going to cross. I'm still in supply. Uh, and now I'm getting closer to relieving this attack, uh, the siege down here. U.S. choices are also kind of painful. Yeah. Another seditious card, which, since I'm moving second, may not be as big a deal. Although I am kind of worried about holding it, but, uh, you know, it becomes a penalty for my next hand if I hold it. If I don't take that four PC disadvantage now, I lose the card. Now, what I'd like to do is get a bunch of PCs, and I've got a bunch here that I could get close. This, however, reduces uh, the use of any CS artillery card and adds three to the U.S. attack strength in any battle. That's pretty good. Uh, this one, the bayonet charge, is useful. And this one is a defense, which will help here, and I'm already seeing some effect for that. Now, these guys are pretty cheap, so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the big old Dahlgren card and try to gain something off that. Now, I've done something in Virginia, so I need not launch an attack against this stack, which is much, much more powerful at this point. I don't really want to screw with Ashby because he'll inflict cav, uh, cav difficulties on me. So the question then becomes, do I want to launch an attack here in Missouri against McCulloch, or which will damage me and make me more uh, weakened in the face of uh, Johnston, or do I want to siege it, which probably won't do anything because it's in supply and I'm not going to be launching many attacks. <sighs> or do I want to do something else, like march out of here? Well, there could be Cav in here. Um, but I could go take Norfolk, one, two, you know? <laughs> and that would be of value. Uh, damned if I know. I'm going to have to meditate on this. <laughs> the Union choice was to back out back into Springfield and attack. Uh, the use of the Longstreet card ended up giving a bonus in combat, which improved McCulloch. Now, um, so actually, both sides basically took one IT of damage. Uh, the U.S. for winning the battle, essentially. And the Confederate, it was just a three-point major victory, minor victory, whatever, minor victory. Uh, the Confederates took one for taking the siege again which means no PC change. But here's what's neat. The Ambrose Hill card comes up, and this is a resource card. It's got the little seal. Uh, it's got combat effects, but it does not have the immediately replaced card when used as a resource. I don't know if that's uh, an error, or if... Uh, some resource cards can not be immediately replaced. See 16.0. Let's see if that should be there or not. Uh, if you played a resource card other than your zero, you draw a new card to replace it. I think that just is lacking that notification on it. Uh, you know, a normal kind of error. But I looked at it, didn't see the red on it, and thought, oh, not a resource card. Cool. Um, but it is uh, very clearly from the effects and i think it would get recovered it just they left the uh the notification out on it whatever um that puts us back on the confederate the confederates beat the union back got a couple of pcs off that 
and then the Union played the Gideon Wells card to throw some blockading fleets. Now, because they're blockading fleets, I guess they get placed immediately as blockades. So I threw one into Savannah. I'm going to get these probably next turn, too. I got a blockade. I think it's three ports to start having an effect. And I did the loss checks. Uh, that also allowed me to bank some PCs. Now I have 10. I can do an invasion. That's kind of what I want to do. Take New Orleans this turn. Uh, I can do that with Warren. He's very likely to succeed. So that's putting me back at the Confederates' hands. We each have two cards, one of which is a sedition card we probably don't want to play, but we may want to because both sides have a decent number of PCs banked. So getting rid of that card so that we reshuffle the deck. The problem is the card goes back in the, the discards, so it might be available again next turn. Or, or next, not next turn, because the deck is still kind of there. I don't think we're going to run out. Next turn's only eight cards. There's more than that there. Okay, overall, uh, Confederates launched using the Hardy card. Uh, they reduced two of the IT or whatever off of this so that it could attack at its normal initiative rating. Not a big deal there. But nobody's got any cards or CSPs left, so the result was pretty bad for the Union. They couldn't withdraw because they had less, uh, they have more IP than the enemy. It ended up being the first major victory that we've had. Now, the first thing that happens is we have to draw for the casualty and uh, disaster because we don't want to resolve uh, the other effects we'd have to rewind them. So both sides have to pull. We did not get anything on here. Here, we got a casualty card. I'm gonna leave that up to remind me that that's there. But otherwise, we take the effects here, um, which is, uh, it was a five point difference. So he's gonna take five IT. That's pretty painful. That means he's going to actually take some real casualties there. That's including that stone wall and everything. Um, and he has to retreat from the city. Well, or take a siege. If I take a siege, I go to 10 IT. Uh, compared to the total number of stars, I have one, two, oh no, total defense factor. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I think 9, 10. So that would equal it. I think it's double is what I have to, uh, is the hopeless offense, uh, defense. Yeah. So I can take this as a siege. That means another casualty, however. Would I rather give up the PC points? It's like three PC points for a retreat and the casualties. Or would I rather... Um, take the casualty itself. I'll take the casualty and take the siege on myself. Now, for the Confederates, they're gonna suffer half as many IT as the defeated army, round it up. That's three IT. And there's no retreating CO and no abandoned city. So, I guess I too am going to be pushed into the casualty range. I'll go in and siege it. Let's put this back where it belongs. We have a leader loss though. Odd it's the Confederates who get to choose it. They do. They're going to go for Lyons himself. Uh, five or six is a death. Yeah, so Lyons is dead. Now he's a two-pointer. That's going to throw this back in the cup. He's a two-star leader in the deceased generals. And I get a, a two-point infantry TCO in his place. Who's in command, but I got a problem. Siegel also has two stars here which may mean that Siegel can take command. Uh, I 
Okay, it's going to cost me a PC if I want to put Siegel in command. If I don't put Siegel in command, the next time I'm attacked, I'm in trouble. So, I really don't want to spend the PC at this point, though. And during the rail phase, I can spend PCs to absorb those TCO points and put somebody else in command. So I'm going to hold off on doing so because I want to do that naval attack instead. And that puts it into the Union hands. And we'll take care of that. Because they're down to a Sedition card and uh, a One Point card. I'll blow that One Point card Oh, one point ain't gonna do it. I thought one point would do it. So, I could send Hooker down. No, he's a two-pointer. Yeah, I don't have anybody I can sail out there on a one-point card. So I'll spend the PC to uh, put Siegel in command instead. Up here at that siege. And I don't know what to do with my one point card to tell you the truth. Okay, here we have a mess. The Union chose to use the one point to activate Hancock here who's marching against Ashby. Now Ashby is allowed to immediately inflict an IT loss with his cab I believe. However, uh, a cav general may harass a moving force by placing one IT on it. However, uh, it can't harass a moving force which has Cav attached, and Hancock reveals that he has Stoneman here. Now what this means, Ashby can't retreat for free uh, because he's facing enemy Cav. He could retreat for free normally with no PC loss if there wasn't any Cav there. Of course, he'd lose the PC in the battle if he has to fight it, but I think we're going to fight this battle now because of that because I'd rather give a siege than, than, uh, than in, because a siege isn't going to succeed in taking anything. Uh, but we'll see what we get. We might get a huge overrun here because we've got a much larger force. We'll see what And indeed, that was an overrun. Uh, the Union ends up taking this at Spartanburg. Uh, they get the two PC off that. They only took one IT. Yeah, see all the acronyms? And Ashby here is disgraced, which means he's just gone. Uh, his strength points are destroyed, and I have to buy him if I want to get him back into the play. He's not a bad general and a cav officer, but you can't hold territory with that. He should have tried to retreat, but he would have fought a cav versus cav battle had he fought a retreat. Hmm, that actually should have only been a seven point difference instead of an eight because Virginia, because it was in the mountains, I counted instead the one point defense for the town. Uh, if I count the two point defense for the mountains, it actually came out to a seven point victory. So let's change these results. I haven't checked for casualties yet. So the defender is going to take the difference. So he takes seven IT. This is probably just as bad. He's going to get disgraced to remove those IT. Uh, but it'll do more damage to the Union. It does four damage to them. Uh, and now the Confederates can take not an additional because my total defense in this hex is only three, so I have to retreat. This is the hopeless case scenario. Uh, I'll retreat. Uh, I'll retreat down to Lynchburg, I guess. I don't know. And this falls. Now the two PC difference happens anyhow, uh, but oh, there's a chance of a disaster. Okay, the attacker is the only one who got a disaster, which if I recall correctly, let's see, we got it here. 
Yeah. Uh, the victor is the only one who got the disaster, so it's no effect. But he does have a casualty coming to him. He gets to choose who's the casualty. I got a pretty good stack here. Let's look at Rosecrans and Pope's other side. Rosecrans is a little better than Pope, so I'm going to take the injury on Pope. Five or six kills him. Yeah, Pope's dead. It gives me an infantry TCO here. And I get a garrison there as well, which I need to place. Reducing the defenses to zero. Now, the Confederates are holding nothing but a seditious character. They'd like a chance to get rid of him. They don't have 10 PC. So they're going to offer a pass. If the Union doesn't want the pass, and they don't, <laughs> uh, then the Confederates get 3 PC. The Union is going to use their 10 point PCs to throw a seditious character away, and so is the Confederacy because their PCs are up there now. I think that's how it works. <laughs> I think the refusal gives three and you still get a chance to play. Maybe I'm incorrect there. Maybe I only get the three if I refuse the chance to play, in which case Nothing happens. I'm looking for the initiative roll. That's early here. No, it's not going to be there. It's going to be under operations, which is where I would think it would be. Ending card play. Players alternate card play. A player may pass if he holds more. If his opponent also immediately passes, the phase ends. If the opponent chooses to play the last card, spurning peace talks, it's three PC or a choice to retain the remaining card. So, uh, I gotta hold this and take the three PC for being honest about my peace talks or whatever, and not insisting on playing the card. Uh, otherwise, I take three PC hit. So, clearly, I wanna keep, uh, keep my PC totals as high as possible at this point. All right. Now that puts us here in spring of 82 or 62. That puts us down to supplies. I think everybody's in supply still. But I have to deal with IT casualties, which is 20.6 in the very back. And this is easy to find with from the sequence apply. Uh, for every five, one general suffers a loss. Well, the Confederates are going first here. So I'm going to take the loss on my TCO general. I don't know if I can do that, but we'll pretend I can. And over here, poor Ashby is disgraced anyhow. Um, for the Union, I have a TCO I can get rid of as well. And it makes sense to me that you could eliminate the TCOs this way because it's not so much that somebody's actually disgraced it's the troops aren't there anymore but over here I have to take two losses and I have two TCOs that I can take under Siegel to get rid of him okay. 
Oh, the siege had to end. I had to withdraw from the siege. Yeah, you can see how effective they are, right? Uh, and now we go down to uh, nobody won. Any CSPs that were gathered would disappear, and the turn marker moves forward. And this one's long enough. We're going to load it up, although it isn't the whole year, obviously. dice here to remind me it's the beginning of a turn yeah. although with all the counters there that's pretty clear all right up it goes